Good evening, everyone. We are officially live. And I guess technology didn't want me to be great today. I was have had everything set up so we can go live right on time. And when I say my joystick fell over, I'm just like, everything just got out of place. So I had to reset everything up which caused our delay but nonetheless we're here so we're going to get ready to uh, jump into this critical this important message so what I need you all to do right now is share this message I know you know somebody who is a parent of uh, a, a high school senior right now, a high school junior, sophomore, freshman, you need to invite them to this video. You, you even need to invite this to the parent who have an incoming freshman who is getting ready to drop their kids off if they haven't yet because this message is critical, it's important, and it is something we definitely need to discuss. This is where we gonna we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. We need to have a lot of come to Jesus meetings about this subject, you guys, because it's very serious and I'm, I can't sugarcoat it. It's just it's just that serious. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about parent plus loans, parent plus loans slash student loans, and how we do college. Because, you know, there's a lot of debate. Is college uh, even a valid pathway? Is it something people should still do? Is it worth it? All of those things. Look, 90% of the jobs are going to require some type of educational or advanced educational um, certificate degree of some sort beyond post secondary I mean beyond a uh, secondary uh, education so that means a trade a certificate an associate's degree bachelor's degree masters whatever it is you're gonna have to have something the problem is we are not making decisions and I'm sure those who have followed me have heard me say this many a times that makes dollars and cents so we're going to talk about that all right, so for those who are new to me, unfamiliar with uh, one of my platforms, my name is Tamika Williamson. I am your college for free coach. I am your college for free expert. I help families strategize and look at how to make college a reality for their kids and for their family, but doing it without student loan debt. It is definitely possible. We've done it. We continue to do it, but you have to understand the process, the science behind the entire process in order to do it right. But unfortunately, we have many families who's not doing it the, the right way, which is why we have this $1.5 trillion student loan crisis. Yes, I said $1.5 trillion. That is what they teach trillion dollar debt crisis is major it's crippling families their abilities to live life their ability to contribute to society and it's leading to other uh, repercussions such as depression such as um, poor credit their inability to buy homes their inability to, to purchase the cars they they really want um, divorces are now being attributed and traced back to student loan debt. So there are a lot of ramifications around this crucial decision that families make and are making as we speak right now. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I thank you all for joining. Again, please share it out because we need to get this word out. We need to start having more dialogue about this particular subject and start thinking smarter and wiser and exercise some discernment and wisdom in how we send our kids to college. I mean, there's no other way to put it. 
So if you have been following me, uh, the last couple of days there was an article that came out. I think today's Tuesday. It seemed like this week. It seemed like we're further along in the week. So the article just came out yesterday. The article came out yesterday in The Root. And it was an article of a, of a mother who drove eight hours. She drove eight hours to bring her child to Atlanta to attend the illustrious Spelman University. Well, unbeknownst to her, when they got here, she was not able to sign for parent loan. Her daughter was already maxed out on loans. So they, of course, have a balance that they could not fulfill at that moment. So the family is now scrambling to raise funds so that her child can stay in school after August 15th. Guys, that's in a few days. So we're going to talk about this because I've gotten a series of emails and requests over the last couple of weeks. Tamika, can you help this student? Tamika, what can we do to help this student? Tamika, what resources would you recommend for this student? And the scenarios are all the same. There was one student who's attending school here in uh, Georgia. And the baby's balance is $15,000. $15,000. This baby came from Ohio to Georgia to attend a state school, mind you, and have a balance of $15,000. Why in the world are we doing that? Ohio has a lot of great state schools where his tuition would have been a lot cheaper, a lot uh, more affordable. But he was trying to find money so he can return for his second year at Georgia State, which is a great state school. But if you can't afford it, it doesn't make dollars and cents. He needed $15,000 to return for his second year for a degree in business management. Guys, we got to do better. Hey, Kia. Thank you for joining. That's one of my, I call her one of my super moms. So uh, we have plenty of dialogue over these subjects. Um, so $15,000. Another student of... Uh, I forgot. Oh, Agnes Scott is the school. It's a school here. $2,500 is what they needed. Guys, we got to do better. Because here's the bottom line. If you do not have 100% of the funds covered for this first school year or this current school year before school starts, that means you're not going to have the funds covered in the remaining years we have to stop thinking in such a short-sighted uh front in, in, in terms of short-sightedness looking at the current the now look it takes on average five maybe six years for some for students to finish their degrees but if you're looking at it year by year then you're already setting you and your child up for failure because if you don't have the money, the funds, year one, you're, you're going to have a difficult time providing or um, having the funds the remaining years. And that's just the reality. So why are we don't making these decisions where, oh, we'll just get them to college and we'll figure it out along the way. I've, I've heard parents say this. We don't have all the money now. I've even heard parents say this for the first semester. We'll just pay the first semester right now and we'll worry about the second semester We'll figure it out. Okay, it's only a few months between the two. We must stop doing this. Stop making these uninformed, ridiculous decisions that don't make dollars and cents. So, and you know what? Kia pointed, is pointing out, and I, uh, I published an article uh, of things parents should do right now. She, she just mentioned the situation right here, right now in Clark, Atlanta, where there are students who don't have anywhere to live now there's a variety of reasons why this is happening you know some students didn't meet their deadlines uh parents schools have deadlines if you don't meet the deadline it's not gonna just be sitting there waiting for you so some students didn't meet the deadline some students don't have the money um so the, uh, there's a lot of these people some people some students didn't pay their deposits on time to secure their room. These are things we need to verify before we even drive eight hours to take our kids to college. We need to know 
what financial aid has been secured, has been locked down, what the housing, what housing has been locked down. So we'll know before we leave our homes, how much money we need to have on hand to pay the balance. Will our child have some, do we have a door to move our child into? And if we don't, we have a game plan on where they're going to live. We have options. We've already thought through the process versus we're getting there. Now we are reacting to the situation instead of being proactive in the beginning and being intentional about how we do this. So that's a whole nother lesson that is, it, they all kind of, they all come together, but I want to dive into this uh, parent plus loan because I constantly run into families in this situation. Um, I remember one of the ladies uh, I met in Houston at one of my workshops and she said she sent her only child to Atlanta. I guess is just, is just hot and popping. We just so lit. Everybody want to come to Atlanta students too, at all costs to our detriment. We make the decision and we send them here, but she sent her only son to Atlanta to attend Morehouse College so he could become a Morehouse man. That was his dream school. And I hear students use these words all the time when it comes to Morehouse and Spelman. These are their dream school. They want to be a Spelman Knight, a Spelman woman, Morehouse man, all those things. She took out a parent loan for her baby to come here. She took out a parent loan for him to come to Atlanta because she wanted to be the best mom there is giving her son what he wanted, helping him to actualize his dreams. Well, good for you, mom. But now, baby boy, don't have a degree, will not graduate from Morehouse because what did he do his first year? Atlanta's so lit, he came here and got turned up. He got turned up so much that he got on academic probation. So academic probation, lost financial aid, had to get his grades up. Eventually, he had to go home. So, he's back home in Houston, probably attending some community college or a local school. But mom has already signed her name on the dotted line, has already released the funds from that parent loan to Morehouse College. They got their money. She has nothing to show for it. He has nothing to show for it. So, now she's stuck with this loan. She got to pay back. We got to exercise wisdom, you guys. So let me just give you all some stats because I, I want you really to understand how critical this is. So we already know $1.5 trillion uh, student loan debt crisis. This also includes parent plus loans. Many of you have heard me talk many times and give stats just around the student loan piece. I know I did a, a piece the other week about depression and and divorces being a link to student loan debt and all those things. But I want you to really understand some stats. So I'm going to share some serious stats with you. And then I'm going to talk about some of the stats related to the parent loan. And then we're going to talk about this article, the story on the mom who drove her child to Spelman, drove eight hours to Spelman to realize she was maxed out on loans. She could not sign for a parent loan because what? She was in bad standing with her own loans and didn't know about it. We're going to talk about that, which impacts her credit because you got to have good credit in order to qualify for uh, parent loans. We're going to talk about that whole situation and how now they're trying to raise funds. Look, guys, raising funds, GoFundMe accounts, all that stuff, it don't work. It's unrealistic, and we'll get into that. But let's get into some of the stats. So like I said, $1.5 trillion is what the student loan balance is right now. That's a lot of money. That is 44.2 million borrowers. 44.2 million. Out of that 44.2 million, 10.7% of the borrowers are delinquent on their student loan. That means they are 90 days past due, meaning they have not paid their monthly payment. Most families are having paid their monthly payments because they can't afford it. So, 90 days past due, 10 point, almost 11% are delinquent, totaling to $31 billion of loans. That's a lot of money. So, then you have 415,000 of the borrowers have a balance greater than $100,000. That means 
they're sitting on a student loan balance at six figures. So that means their student loan monthly payment is a thousand dollars or more a month. If they if they are not on an income based or if they didn't qualify, because you gotta qualify to be on income based, income sensitive repayment plans. Everybody don't qualify that for that. It depends on what type of loans you have. So a thousand dollar, a hundred thousand dollars in student loans, you're looking at at least a thousand dollars a month in payments. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know what? I said those numbers backwards. I'm sorry. Four hundred and fifteen thousand have a balance greater than two hundred thousand dollars. Two million of the borrowers have a balance of a hundred thousand dollars, over a hundred a hundred thousand dollars or more. So that's a lot of money. So. Can you take a guess what tar what are the two largest age groups that have the greatest balance in student loans? Can anybody guess? Because there's a lot of commentary on this group. Any guesses? Any thoughts? Nobody want to take a chance? Well, well, let me just help you out. These are our babies, our millennials. The top group is age 30 to 39. The second group is less than age 30. So basically, you said 35 to 45. You were close, Nishita. You were close. So we're basically looking at everybody under the age of 40. Th those are our two largest groups. So 30 to 39 have a balanced total $461 billion. $461 billion. And those under the age of 30, not far behind, $384 billion. That's how much debt they're covering, they're, uh, they have. These are the two largest age groups, two largest age groups that dominate the student loan uh, balance. So this is why millennials are staying at home with parents because they can't afford to live on their own. This is why they are delaying the start of families. This is why they're not having kids. This is why they can't purchase homes. They're not purchasing homes. This is why they, uh, they don't have the ability to purchase cars or get the cars they will like. They have to get something used, a smaller uh, price point because they don't have the disposable income to spend on these other elements that contributes to our economy. So we have to be practical again in the decisions we make and to your point, Kia, we're going to talk about that. We got to do better at looking at looking for scholarships. We must do better. So we got to do something about this. But our focus here is on parent loans. I wanted to give you those basic stats, but let's talk about parent loans because your parent plus loans accounts for about $84 billion. Eight, $84 billion and you have about 3.5 million borrowers. So that's 3.5 million parents who account for $84 billion in parent loans. That's how much money parents have taken out to pay for their child's education. That's all the parent loan is. This is them paying for their kids' education. This doesn't include their loans. Because most many parents who have parent loans, they have their own loans. All right? So... Parent loans, $84 billion. Then we have graduate plus loans. These are the loans graduate students are taking out to pay for their education. That is 1.2 million borrowers at $60 billion. So your parents who have the parent loans, also some of them fall under the grad plus loans because many of them have their own student loans to pay for their degrees. So you got these three tiers. You got the parents, you have the graduate level, and then you have the undergraduate level. So these are the three different levels where we get loans to fund education. This is what's attributing to the debt crisis, 1.5 million. Because what people don't realize is student loans have a limit. There's a cap. Parent loans and uh, graduate loans don't have uh, those caps. Okay, so it allows them to borrow more money, which is why they have more debt. So not only is the child in debt, 
we have the entire family in debt. So again, the kids are at home living with their parents because they can't afford to live on their own. But in some instances, the kids are actually helping out the parents because the parents are strapped. Because they took out parent loans to cover their tuition. This must stop. It must stop, you guys. This is just getting out of control. It, no, it has already gotten out of control. We got to do better. And there's things we can't do. So, when we think about the dynamics of who's raising our kids, so this is another disturbing trend that's happening. We know the cost of college is skyrocketing. But there's another dangerous trend that's out there. The number of borrowers over the age 60. Yes, the number of borrowers over the age 60 has basically, I think it's almost doubled. It's the fastest growing segment right now for student loans. Because what they're doing is they're paying for their children and or their grandchildren's college education. So now you got 60 plus years old pe uh, families where some of them are on I fixed income and they got parent loans. Guys, it doesn't make sense. So let's just talk about some of the unique things that people, I guess, find attractive or the reason why they get parent loans. I don't know. Here are some of the, th the terms or the things that comes with parent loans you need to understand. One, the parent loan interest rate is always higher than the regular student loan interest rate. Right now, the parent uh, the parent plus loans is running, I think, 7.4% is what it is. So you're paying a 7.4% interest rate. It is a fixed rate, but it is higher than student loan rate, which is about 4%, 4.5%. 4, 4 um, there were 794,000 borrowers for the parent plus loan in 2016-2017 school year. 2016-2017 school year. 794,000 borrowers. Do you know that number is 100? That's a 100% increase from the number of borrowers 20 years prior. So in 20 years, we have basically increased the number of parents borrowing money to pay for their kids' education 100%. That is sad. That is alarming. And everyone should be concerned. Everyone should be concerned because us as tax taxpayers, you know, we fund student loans, especially when they go into fall, when they're forgiven and all those things. Who takes the hit? Taxpayers. Now, we need to all be engaged. This is not some people's problem. This is everybody's problem. So the on average families or parents are borrowing about $16,000. But here's something to keep in mind. People don't think about this. I read an article on a mom and I think it was in Money Magazine and she talked about how she was so focused on and this is where most a lot of families are at. They're so focused on making college a reality, getting their child in college, helping them to start school and stay in school that they don't think about the after. They don't think about the repayment period and how difficult it's going to be and what that total amount is going to be because you really don't know or won't know the total amount until your child graduates. Because again, if you need a loan the first year, you're going to need a loan years two, three, four, five. And you got to hope that you don't max out in those remaining years because you can take on too much debt to your income, that ratio can be so high that you won't get approved for those remaining years. So now you're stuck trying to figure out how your child is going to complete their degree after spending the first three years at this college. They're deep into their major. Now we got to think about how we're going to cover it. Because you talk about transferring. Transferring is not as easy as you think. The further along you get into a program, the more difficult it is to transfer to another college. That's a whole nother lesson. The risk that comes with transferring and changing your majors and all those things. So they're not thinking about the repayment. 41,000 parents, 41,000, 41,000 parents in the year 2015 
had their paychecks, their income tax return, and their social security, y'all, garnished. Yes, they garnished the social security checks to pay for default student loan bills. Remember, this is government, honey. They gonna get their money. They want their money. So they have the power to garnish your funds, to garnish your account. This is the debt you can't get rid of. It is the debt you cannot file bankruptcy for. Okay? The only way parents can get out of paying, paying back a parent plus loan is if the child dies or if they become uh, disabled the parent and and or possibly the child but you have to go through a, a process to make that happen but those are the top reasons the loan uh, parents will be able to stop paying back the parent loan otherwise you on the hook for it until it's paid off and less than 30 percent of the, of the population of borrowers pay off their student loan there are people i know who have made it the determination in their mind they're never going to pay off their student loan and they are not putting forth any type of effort to pay it off they choose to just try to pay the uh, the minimum or defer it as long as they can by keep going to school getting degrees doing uh, all these other backdoor tactics to delay the inevitable people are doing it so some people are playing the game. They're playing the system. But why are we even putting our kids in this situation from the beginning? There are many reasons, and we're going to talk about that. So if you guys have questions, feel free to drop it in the chat uh, as well. All right, so when you talk about parent plus loans, there are some critics who use the term predatory lending with parent plus loans because schools, colleges, universities have no incentive to dissuade you from getting a parent plus loan. You may be thinking, well, why? Well, that's money that they get. They get the funds up front. So when you are approved for a parent loan, they get the funds up front. So when you, hey, Santino, thank you for joining. Welcome. So when you, if you rather, default on your loan, it doesn't impact the school because they already got theirs. It impacts you as a parent and your credit and everything else. We, we already just talked about 41,000 people getting their paychecks, their uh, uh, income tax returns and Social Security garnished because they were default on their uh, student loans. Now... Schools can be penalized if there's a trend or a pattern of multi, a large volume of students defaulting on their loans. But the penalty schools get is it pales into it pales in comparison to what families deal with in terms of what their impact is and what their uh, repercussions are when they default. So schools again have no incentive to dissuade parents from signing on the dotted line to get uh, parent plus loans. All right. Now, if we have to get a loan, I, I always tell my parents, I never recommend parent plus loans. I, I don't because you have to start paying those back. You're on the hook for them. And again, like I said, if you need it one year, you're going to need the remaining years. But if you do get parent plus loans, student loans, whatever the case is, we also need to learn to borrow only what we need. We should not be borrowing extra money to cover our lifestyle and all those other things. That that should not happen. Once those funds are dispersed, uh, what families need to know is you can return it or and or you can return some of the money if you find that it's too much. You don't have to hold on to all of it. It's just like buying a house. If you are approved for X amount of dollars, that doesn't mean you have to buy the house at that full approval rate smart people who are financially savvy will buy under what their purchasing power is so same concept when you think about plus loans uh 
So, yeah, so we got to just think about that. Now, when you do get a parent loan, there is an origination fee that you have to pay as well as a disbursement fee. So there are fees that comes with borrowing the money on top of the interest rate when it comes to paying it back. So you got to really think about it. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Or how much is it worth to you and to your, uh, to your family? So again, parent plus loans, we have to think twice about getting them. Now, I mentioned earlier, people get parent plus loans because it uh, allows you to cover what the entire balance is. So they, they work with the school based on what the need is, what the balance is, and that's how they come up with the amount. And if you have the credit and the history uh, in terms of the qualifications, then they'll approve you for the amount. Now, again, schools have no, in no uh, incentive to not approve you because they, they going to get their money. But the students, when they do student loans, there's a cap. So there's a, mis, a myth out there that students and families believe financial aid, which includes loans, grants, scholarships, will cover 100% of their tuition. That is a myth. That is not going to happen for everybody at all schools. That's why you need third-party scholarships, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So when we talk about student loans, student loans only range from $5,500 to $7,500 at the max, and that is dependent upon what grade level. So freshmen get the lowest amount, and it increases all the way up to their senior year. That's why parents get Parent PLUS loans, because there's a cap on how much money the student can borrow unless you go and utilize private borrowers now you think the the uh government is treacherous in garnishing social security and all those other things get private loans oh <laughs> they, they they not friendly they want their money and they they're going to do everything they can to get their money and they're very treacherous at doing it so you got to be mindful again when you're talking about getting loans so with parent loans, again, it's not available for everybody. Some parents just think, oh, I'll just get a parent loan. Boo, you got to qualify for the parent loan. Meaning you can't have any dis uh, delinquencies, any type of credit blemishes on your credit report for the last five years. If you have any blemishes in the last five years, you're not getting approved for no parent loan. So then what you going to do? So you can't just assume that you will qualify and that you will get a parent loan because that is not guaranteed either. So that's another side of the fence. All right. So those are some, of, those are some of the stats and some of the realities I wanted you to understand. I wanted you to hear concerning student loans, parent plus loans, and the overall student loan debt crisis as a whole. So let's go back to the article of the mom. And mom is a veteran because I was sitting there thinking, well, where's her military benefits? So I don't know. It I guess it depends on how, uh, what type of veteran she is and all those things. But she's a veteran. She drove her child eight hours to Atlanta so her child can attend Spelman College this year. Only to find out Cause she was, she just assumed that she could get a parent loan to cover the balance of her child's tuition. Guys, Spellman, we're talking about, about $45,000 a year, 45, 40, $45,000. That's a lot of money. And I already said 5,500 is the amount freshmen get for student loan. So she already, her daughter had already got the max loan, um, I don't, it didn't mention anything about scholarships. If they did have one, it was very few. And her mom was going to get a parent loan. But she didn't know until she got here that that was not an option. Because she has this outstanding balance of her own that she didn't know about. And she attributed it to uh, moving and things not being forwarded. Yeah, we are, we, it's 2018, digital, 
access computers, internet. All you gotta do is log into the student loan portal and they they send you emails. So even if they lose you in terms of mail, you should always know what your student loan balance is. All right, but she didn't know, she said she didn't know. So now they are raising funds. So I think this article was published, I think, last Saturday. So now they're raising funds so that her child can remain at Spelman after August 15th. August 15th is this week, you guys. So if you think you can raise 15000 5000 for that matter, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in a week's time, please raise your hand. Help me. Let me know. Because that is an unrealistic expectation. GoFundMe accounts, unrealistic option. I had um, I had a child, one of the students I told you about that, some, I was, that someone reached out to me in helping, saying if I had any ideas on how to help them, started a GoFundMe account. What people don't realize is GoFundMe is going to take 30% of what's raised. So if you just set it at the amount that you need, you're still going to be short. But the reality is you're not going to, the likelihood of you raising those funds, that amount of money in such a short amount of time is, 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 is close to impossible. Now I know Jesus, I love the Lord and all things are possible. So I don't doubt what he can do, but being practical and realistic. Okay. We got to wake up and see that is not a practical and realistic approach at all. So GoFundMe accounts, these last minute funding efforts, no, it's just not possible. So let's talk about the problems with this, this family, with this situation. One, failure to plan effectively. Parents, we got to start planning how we're going to do college, how our child is going to do college so that we know what the expectations are. We know what we can and what we can't do and we plan accordingly. So we got to start mapping out a game plan, a strategy on how we're going to cover college. If you know you don't have Spelman $45,000 a year, because remember, if she needed a parent loan this first year, she's going to need a parent loan the remaining years. If you don't have that money, then you need to start looking at more affordable options. We need to start exploring what our other options are. Or you need to have a serious, serious game plan on how you're going to raise the funds, but you can't wait till their last year in uh, high school to begin thinking about that process neither. Okay. So one, there was a failure to plan effectively in, uh, with this family, which is why now they're scrambling, trying to figure out how to get their child in college this fall. The other part of that failure to plan is I don't understand how they did not know what the child was getting in financial aid prior to them driving eight hours. Financial aid award letters are sent out beforehand. If you don't have it before your child is set to uh, arrive at school, then you need to make some phone calls to the financial aid office to find out what's the status of your child's financial aid, how much money are they getting, what the balance is, so that you can make plans in terms of how that balance is going to be covered. It should not be you arriving at the school and you get this, oh, surprise, you uh, don't qualify for this. This is not available. This is what your balance is. No, that doesn't work. That shouldn't happen. So failure to plan effectively is one of the areas they needed to, um, they could have improved upon. The second problem with this uh, scenario is unrealistic funding expectations they had unrealistic funding expectations they expected one the parent the mom expected that she would just get the parent loan you got to qualify for the parent loan you guys she just assumed that she would qualify she would use that to pay the balance they assumed that the loan their child got would cover uh the uh housing and meal plan no, did, 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 did you not evaluate what the cost of attendance was for Spelman and match it up to the funds 
you, uh, your child was awarded in scholarships, if any, the funds you saved, the funds you pulled out, pulling out of a 529 if you had one, and seeing what the gaps are, that should have been done well in advance. They should have been clear about what was going to be expected and how it was going to be covered. So unrealistic funding expectations. Yeah, that that was one of their other uh, areas of opportunities. And then uh, raising funds, look, scrambling, looking at how this is what they told the news station. They were scrambling, looking at how they can raise funds within a two week time frame. You're trying to raise funds to cover tuition and all the remaining costs for your child to attend Spelman. OK, yeah, no, that is not realistic. So, failure to plan effectively, unrealistic funding expectations. Three, lack of scholarships. Parents, everybody listen, if you guys don't get this, if you're mentoring a child, your own children, whatever the case is, please hear me and hear me loud. You need scholarships, period. Exclamation mark, actually, exclamation mark, multiple exclamation mark. You need scholarships. You need third-party scholarships. School financial aid, if you are expecting financial aid from the school to cover 100% of your child's cost of attendance, you are in for a disappointment. You are in for a disappointment. You need to make sure you, your child is applying for third-party scholarships. That process should start ideally in middle school. There are scholarships available to children starting at fourth and fifth grade. But you should at least start when your child is in middle school or ninth grade at the latest. Waiting until they become a junior and a senior to start looking for scholarships, you are decreasing the opportunities the, you're decreasing the funding opportunities your child can amass toward, to use towards their college tuition. All right? So please, please, please start applying for scholarships now. If you don't know how to do it, where to start, what to do, go to crushcollegedebt.com. Put your, email, your name and email address in. We will, it's going to automatically email you. Our free ebook, Five Simple Steps on How to Find Scholarships. Five Simple Steps on How to Find Scholarships. So that's just dealing with how to find scholarships. Now, positioning yourself and um, being attractive, now that's a whole nother uh, ball game, and that's a whole nother, uh, that's a different type of investment. But at least it gives you the five steps on how to do it. All right. So third mistake is lack of scholarships. Fourth mistake, wrong school choice. Wrong school choice. Uh, parents don't understand every school is not created equal. Every school is not created equal from an admission standpoint, from a funding standpoint. That is why the types of schools we select is going to impact the type of funds our child receives in the on the back end. So we have to make sure we are targeting schools that award funds favorable to our budget. For example, I told you Spelman is about $40,000, $45,000 a year. Spelman is a school that does not award a lot of money to their, especially income and freshmen. They have some top tier scholarships, but only a handful of students get those scholarships compared to the uh, number of students they bring in. Spelman's target audience are students who come from families who can write a check. That means you have the financial means to just write a check. Or you have a, um, a 529 or some type of college investment that you've had in place for years that allows you to write the check. If you cannot just write a check for $45,000, hey Pamela, thank you for watching from Texas. Yay, welcome. If you can't afford to write a check, then Spelman should not be at the top of your list. Unless 
you're talking about your child's in eighth in seventh grade or sixth grade and they want to go to Spelman and you're going to start this funding scholarship campaign where you're going to start applying for scholarships. You're going to put in the sweat equity, the work to make it happen. Now that's a whole different ball game. But if your child is already in high school and you're talking about attending a school like Spelman and you haven't done anything in terms of scholarships, you have no money saved, any of that, then you need to rethink your school selection. So their, th their fourth mistake was selecting the wrong school. We got to make sure we get educated on the college admissions process, understand what to look for, and use that information to help us make the right decisions that's best for our family that also makes dollars and cents. This is how we keep our kids from going into student loan debt. And this is how we keep you parents from having to get plus loans. So the fifth mistake, the final mistake I'm going to point out is poor financial management. The mom not being aware that she had some issues with her own student loan, which was causing her credit to be impacted negatively, that, that shouldn't have been. We, if we have student loans, I know what my student loan is. I, log, I can log into Naviance at any time. I know the status of my loan. I get communications from them uh, via email. I don't get nothing in the mail. I, I don't need to worry about keeping up with mail. At minimum, we should have some type of knowledge, uh, uh, some type of electronic communication set up with whoever our borrower, uh, who we, whoever we owe the money to. And then we need to be more diligent in how we manage our finances, period. From student loan to your, your checking account, uh, period. Yes, Angela, I'm with you. She says, I'm totally against parent plus loans. Yes, that, that is my message. If a parent asks me about a parent plus loan, I'm going to tell them it is not something I recommend. I am against it. Another thing I'm against, there's, there's two big things I'm against in terms of funding college education, parent plus loans and pulling from, well, actually, I guess there may be three parent plus loan pulling from your retirement and IRA and pulling equity out of your home. I don't recommend any of those. But Parent Plus Loan is definitely at the top of the list. Next in line would be pulling from your retirement. And then thirdly is pulling the equity out of your home. There's too many scholarships out there, you guys. And I uh, saw somebody post, well, all the scholarships are for 3.0 and above or 3.5 and above. No, that is not true. That is not true. We posted yesterday was left-handed day. So in tribute... To all the students who are left-handed, we posted a host of scholarships for students who were left-handed. The scholarships were unique and specific for students who are left-handed. So some of those scholarships didn't even have a grade requirement. Some did. I saw some as low as, two. I think, 2.8, 2.5 GPA. So all scholarships are not what we call merit-based scholarships. Because you have your merit-based. You also have scholarships available for being left-handed, being flat-footed, being tall, being short. You have what's called, I'll call, I call them social influence scholarships. So scholarships that is set up for like drunk driving campaign, the fight against cancer. So uh, they're, they're socially driven by what's happening in our world and our economy. So there are scholarships out there. There's scholarships for everything. Every little bit helps. The problem is we are not looking for them. We're not starting soon enough. If we look for them and we start soon enough, then we can accumulate the money over time. And what you should be looking at is how can I add more to the bank, to the college bank account? How can I add more to the college bank account? So you guys should be targeting every type of scholarship that's out there. Some require essays, some don't, some are contests, whatever the case is. <clears throat> You should be going after it. So we should be going after scholarships. Um, in this digital age, we have, because now with the whole trend around gaming, you know, I used to tell parents all the time, if your child is into gaming, they should do gaming competitions so that they could uh, win money. 
because students use that money to pay for college. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a lot of money in gaming. Now, what do you see happening? Schools are now adding it as a new uh, major students can pursue. And now they're putting structure around these gaming competitions. I forgot what it's called. Game Dreamer or Dream or something. It was on, I think, Good Morning America or something the other week. And they're formulating teams around it. And there's mad money in it. Because I know years ago, there was a young guy in uh, Detroit who won so much money in gaming competitions, coding, that he paid off his parents' home and still had money left over. So we have to look at what our kids are good at. How can we monetize it and use it to pay for their, co uh, their college tuition? So there's so many ways we can do this if we start early and we start thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, Angela shared uh, my Scully, the Scully app, which is a great app. I think uh, we even list some of the we list Scully and some other websites at the end of the ebook. So again, if you don't know how to look for scholarships, you can go to uh, crushcollegedebt.com, put your name, email address, and you will automatically get the download to uh, the five simple steps for finding scholarships. And we have resources on there on where you can find scholarships, like the my Scully app. Uh, let's see, Tawan, let's see, also here in Texas, high school students are able to do dual college credit for free while in high school. Can you touch on that helping, uh, I don't know if every state has this. Yes, every state does have this. Uh, I remember, maybe I need to go and dig that link out. I had, I did a, um, you know, I'm a repost. I did a, a video on that last year for our back to school rally, and I'll repost that video, and I'll I'll go find the link and post it. There's a link that lists all of the states and what their dual enrollment programs are and what they entail, and they have the links to them as well. So, uh, pretty much every state has some type of dual uh, dual uh, enrollment program. Uh, most of the dual enrollment programs, parents, you don't pay nothing out of college. I mean, out of pocket. It's a great way for your child to get those basic classes out of the way. Now, with the dual enrollment, um, what you the thing you have to be mindful of is, like here in Georgia, uh, the dual enrollment programs they have an articulation agreement with pretty much most of the major universities here in the state. So that means your child can attend one of those colleges and your, their, their dual enrollment classes, their credits will transfer. Now there are, when you talk, when you get into your more selective schools, that's when dual enrollment may not be a good idea for them because they will not be able to transfer those credits. But you have to look at each school on an individual basis. Because, again, remember I said all schools are not equal when it comes to admissions and when it comes to financial aid. So you got to know what their requirements are. And you got to know, hey, will they accept uh, credits from this school? I would look at what my top five schools are. And I will reach out to those schools first before I sign up for dual enrollment. Because I would want to run the schools I'm looking to pursue in dual enrollment for my child to see if they will accept credits from that school. Because you may want to be more selective at the school you do your dual enrollment um, credits, uh, get your, your child get their dual enrollment credits from if you have that choice. For example, like here, uh, we have students who may go to like Georgia Perimeter uh, one of our com our uh, community colleges and get and do their dual enrollment classes, whereas some students may go to Georgia State. Georgia State is considered a major university and a a, a well recognized university. So some schools may be willing to accept your child's credit, dual enrollment credits from Georgia State, and not accept it from Georgia Perimeter. So I would. Uh, do that research beforehand before signing your child up for the dual enrollment program. So that way you're not wasting, you're, you're not wasting energy and time. Now, uh, I guess another way to look at it, the state may not like this, is if the state's paying for it, it, it is a great way to at least test your child's readiness and help them get their feet wet and get prepared for college before they go off on their own and they're taking on 
uh, these college classes with a cost factor that comes with it. So it could be a way to test it out and your child just have to repeat the class. I mean, you know, it's, 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 I actually see it as no different as, than doing uh, AP and IB courses. Because I know like when I took AP Calculus, I mean not AP Calculus, IB Calculus when I was in high school, whew, over 20 something years ago, almost 25 years ago, um, the same thing I learned in IB Calculus, we covered in Cal 1 and basically Cal 2. I was an I'm an engineer by trade, so I had to take calculus one, two, and three. I didn't, I wasn't challenged in calculus until I got to calculus three because calculus one and two was basically a review for me from what I uh, did in IB. So, so yeah, dual dual enrollment is a way to bring that overall college tuition down, tuition bill down, and get your child some credits. But I would do uh, some due diligence on the front end. So that way, again, you know what you're working with. You know what you're working with. So that goes back to that planning, that effective planning. So thank you for that question. Hopefully um, that gave some clarity and, and that helped other parents who are listening as well, uh, looking at those options. So what I'll do, like I said, I'll, I'll repost those videos on the College for Free page. So if you're not following College for Free, make sure you follow the College for Free page, like the page. Um, you'll, you're going to start seeing more and more scholarships being posted uh, as well. We can, we are just, we should be one of many sources you are pursuing in identifying scholarships for your child. So, those who have followed me always hear me say, the time to be ready is not the time to get ready. We got to learn how to stay ready, and the more diligent we are in planning and having a strategy and getting educated on the process. Oh wow, I guess there's a timeline for Facebook. They uh, cut my video off online. All right, so I guess I'll finish talking to you guys because on my page it's cut me off. Um, you wanna make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do to make sure your child is ready. You want to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. So, if you uh, need some help, we do have resources. Uh, yeah, no, Monica, I'm I I'm doing a live in the College for Free group, and I did one on my personal page. My personal page is where Facebook cut me off. So, I don't know. I was getting ready to wrap it up anyway, but I guess it decided to wrap up for me. Technology has not been my friend today. Uh, nonetheless, but, um, I hope this has been helpful to you all, but, uh, if you need more guidance, more direction, we have products, we have services in the college for free platform. Um, on my little UCLA bear, one of my, my babies who graduated from UCLA. Those who don't have the book, this book maps out, uh, the college admissions process so you can understand what the process is and it gives you checklist item I checklist items from starting at grades eight all going all the way up to grades 12 so this is a book I definitely recommend for parents of middle school students and parents of students who are uh, like their freshman sophomore year of high school uh, well I guess juniors may benefit from this as well uh, so that's a resource and we also have a host of other resources. So if you go to uh, collegeforfree.info, you'll find our College for Free University store. So there are some do it, D, D, uh, DIY uh, uh, services you can select. There's products you can select. And we're actually wrapping up this week with our uh, graduating seniors. This is the last week for graduating seniors to even sign up for strategy sessions because... Uh, the, the deadline is the end of the week, as well as we are at maximum capacity with the number of students we could take on this year. We only have two slots left. So if you are a parent of a graduating senior and you want to put a strategy in place and look at how you can prevent yourself from being in the position of this mom this time next year, 
then now is the time for you to schedule a uh, discovery call and or go ahead and say, hey, you know what? I want to sign up. Uh, where do I get, how do I get started? So you can inbox us. You can set up a call uh, on the website as well. I'll post the link uh, in the chat box. But know that again, this week is the last week to sign up and we only got two slots left. So you got to gotta, um, act fast, act fast. And we do offer payment plans for that program as well. So I'm going to wrap it up. I thank you all for joining me. I hope y'all got something out of this parent's story. If you hadn't read the story, the story is posted on the page. So read the story, um, replay this message, Get uh, find out what I identified as the five mistakes they made and the mistakes that we as parents have to stop uh, supporting. We have to help our kids make the right decisions and we have to stop letting them make the decisions on their own. They don't have the maturity and the wisdom to make this type of decision on their own. I hear parents giving their kids the choice of where they want to go and then they just figure out how to pay it. That is crazy. We cannot afford to do that. That's why we have this $1.5 trillion debt crisis. So before I get back into another lesson, I'm going to go ahead and, and call this in because I'm so passionate about this because it is just crippling our families in such a detrimental way and we're not raising enough noise about it so <clears throat> we're going to talk about it some more and we're going to keep talking about it and we're going to keep talking about it all right so again the time to be ready is not the time to get ready look at how you can stay ready all right so this is tamika williamson your college for free expert your college for free coach signing out until next time see you in the next video.